Thank, thanks, Gav. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, I, uh, I don't get to speak to the Victorian branch very often. I think the last time I did was when I was president of Aries. And, uh, uh, and, and the branch, I'll, before you go, Gav, I want to uh, say, give you a, a bouquet. I, I think uh, it's, it's great to see the, the Victorian branch doing so well. I wasn't doing nearly as well when I was the Victorian branch president. And uh, I think Dave and, and Gavin are really done a good job, but even though they're sometimes a bit careless in their choice of speakers. So, <laughs> well, thanks for that. Um, and, uh, and the last time I did speak, I think, was when we were trying to build the branch up by being entertaining. We held a debate, and, and I can't remember what the topic was. The only thing I can remember was <coughs> Bill Malcolm, who, who was the opposite side, and he accused me of being a cunning linguist. Uh, which I, I thought it was harsh. But it, it, it relates to today's topic, because you see this Splendid Mendax. Uh, that's, that's Latin, and uh, uh, I don't know how I found that, but, but uh, it means uh, uh, it's a life for a good purpose, uh, is what Splendid Mendax means. And so uh, well, that's what this is about. Um, I, uh, at Davis, I, uh, the reason you have these uh, handouts is because you probably won't be able to see what's on the screen here. I'm sorry about that, but I come to depend on these things for how I do talks. Uh, so, uh, on the front here is, is uh, I direct the, the Robert Mondavi Institute Centre for Wine Economics. I've got this Centre for Wine Economics that I took on. Uh, jointly, I made a, a decision to, to do a project on Pierce's disease of wine grapes. And I've been working on that with Kate Fuller, who did a dissertation with me. She's still working here. She actually works at Davis. He's retired now, but he was a winemaker for about 20 years, and he taught winemaking at Davis. And he hangs around the Agricultural Issues Centre with Dan Sumner and me. And uh, Kabir Tumba was a, a research assistant. He's gone. And George Salais works at the Liquor Control Board of Ontario, Canada, and he played a useful role in giving us some data. So lots of people involved in this. Um, I took on this uh, uh, Centre for Wine Economics. I said, if I'm going to do this, there has to be some funding. Uh, and I got funding to do a project on Pierce's disease uh, uh, in, in the wine industry. Pierce's disease is a, is a bacterial <coughs> disease of wine grapes that are spread by uh, uh, this uh, uh, xylem feeding insects called sharpshooters. Uh, and uh, and it's, it's been in California forever. This, you can see this green, blue green sharpshooter lives in the Napa Valley. It doesn't fly very far and uh, it infects vineyards at the edge of riparian areas and causes big losses every year, but, but not, uh, it's chronic. Uh, and then 10 or so years ago, this, this thing, these aren't to scale, but this uh, the one on the right, it looks nasty, that's the, that's the glassy wing sharpshooter, and that came from uh, somewhere down south. Uh, and, and it flies a lot farther, it can do a lot more damage, and it devastated the, the wine, wine growing area in Temecula in Southern California. And so they set up a program to, to control this thing, to control the movement of grape material in the state. Uh, spending a lot of money trying to, to manage this thing. And, and they asked me to do a project to evaluate their research and offset priorities. And this is our first cut on what this thing is costing. We, we estimated it was costing about $110 million a year in California at present, in the presence of this program that's controlling it. So it's a fairly serious problem. Um, about uh, half of that is uh, the program trying to control it, and the other half is losses in the presence of the program. So it, it kills vines, they have to replace them, you have foregone production and, and so on. Uh, and this is part of the cost. We've done uh, uh, a lot of work now and, and got a, a much better measure of these costs, and they're actually higher than that. Uh, in spite of uh, us finding that the research program really pays, they've shut the research program down, because this thing comes and goes and it's been pretty quiet for Pierce's disease, that's a big mistake. And so it's going to be uh, a devastating problem at some point, I think. Um, so it's been a good research program. We learned a lot about Pierce's disease, and it's actually it's become a model disease because uh, spending that kind of money focused on something, you learn more general things. Uh, they've, they've found some solutions. That genetic solutions are the main idea. Uh, and uh, I recommend you don't read ahead, by the way. I'll say this to my students. say, never listen to me when I say that. You'll, you'll spoil some things for yourself if you do that. Uh, so, so the 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 the, uh, the solutions they found are, are, are genetic ones. They can do conventional breeding by crossing with uh, native varieties, uh, like the ones that have resistance to phylloxera, uh, uh, and uh, uh, 
uh, they can do it with biotech. Uh, the, the big problem with both of these solutions is that the industry is quite strange and they, they resist anything novel. And so these, uh, these conventionally bred ones have 99% 99.9% vinifera, .9 but 0.1% but California native uh, grapes, and, and that's a new variety, and even though it's exactly like Cabernet except for this case. And so the industry is scared of going touch it. So, uh, so what happens, I got into that, and I'm thinking you've got to model Pierce's disease, you've got to look a long time into the future. Uh, what's climate change going to do to this problem? What's it going to do to the, because the, the pest depends on the weather. Uh, and what's it going to do to the prevalence of the problem uh, as California warms up or the climate change in other ways, will the spread of this pest become more serious? It, it lives in lots of plants, it lives in oleanders, it likes them, so it can, can march down I-5 uh, march up I-5 through the oleanders and make its way to... Uh, anyway, uh, so, so I started thinking about uh, what's happening in climate change, thinking about having to model Pierce's disease 50 or 100 years down the road, and, uh, and start to learn that there's something going on in, in the wine industry. So I noticed that there's been a, a really substantial rise in the sugar content of grapes and harvest, uh, and that could have been caused by... Uh, uh, Changing climate could have been caused by some other things too. Uh, it, it may have been the, the industry's grown a lot. They're growing more premium varieties in different places, uh, and people could have been choosing to make grapes uh, out of wine differently. Um, there's a story about wine that, that the wine writers like Robert Parker or James Tullamy, for that matter, uh, but, but particularly Parker is known as somebody who gives high point scores to wines that have full, uh, strong flavours, intense flavours. Uh, ripe fruit flavours. Uh, one way to get those characteristics is to let the grapes hang on the vine a little longer. Uh, you're trading off acid against uh, ripeness and sugar, and uh, and so you get and basically the, the, the grapes dry out a little bit. They become a bit more raisiny, and so just everything more concentrated, including the sugar. So so one start story maybe people are trying to get Parker points. They're doing things different in the vineyard. They get the, they get the Parker points, but they get this alcohol effect. Is, it's not something they really wanted, but they get that inadvertently. So we've done a lot of analysis. We've got uh, a lot of data. We've got one paper published in the Journal of Wine Economics where we analyse lots of data on sugar content of grapes by uh, 17 crush districts in California, different varieties of grapes, uh, uh, and basically didn't find very much going on. Uh, and, uh, and then we've got uh, a huge data set from the Liquor Control Board of Ontario in Canada where they, uh, they test every wine that's important, uh, and, and they test this for its alcohol content. And so every bottle of alcohol, every bottle of wine that's sold in California has a, an alcohol statement on the label, but we know it's not very precise. We, we know this big tolerance, plus or minus one or one and a half percent. Uh, and so it's the idea we want to say what's happening to actual alcohol content, we get this Canadian data. We've got it mainly to find out what's going on, but then we notice that there's a difference between what it says on the label and what's in the bottle. So this other question is, what's going on with this uh, false uh, statement? And so uh, this, this paper, Splendid Mendax, is really about this uh, final step in this process. So I don't know if you can see that, but um, these things are going up. The top one, now you can look at your slides. Uh, you have permission to look at the first slide. Carefully avoid looking at the paper. Uh, so this, uh, this basically has a, a graph since 1980 uh, to 2009, uh, showing uh, degrees bricks. That's a, a measure of sugar content of grapes. It's soluble sugar per 100 millilitres. Uh, uh, so, uh, and, and you get about uh, <coughs> uh, 0.5. Uh, if you multiply by 0.55, you convert. Degrees of bricks approximately into percent alcohol. So, so uh, 20 degrees bricks is about 11 percent alcohol. Uh, so, so what happens here? We start off with uh, 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 red wine. At the top was was around 22 degrees bricks at the beginning of the period, and got up to uh, 23 and a half and 24 at the end. And, uh, and white wine started off lower and ended up close to 23. So, the average went up by about 11 percent. Uh, that's the average across all the grapes harvested in California over this period. That's, that's quite a large rise over a fairly short period. Uh, and that, that implies uh, everything else is equal. But uh, 
we're, we're basically uh, increasing, uh, unless they do something differently, uh, the alcohol content of the wine is going to increase by 11%. Uh, say, you give a start off at 12 percentage points, 12% uh, uh, 12, 12 alcohol, that's uh, going to go up by another whole point, roughly. Uh, so, that's a significant rise, uh, if that's what happened. And so the, the question we were asking is, is that nature or nurture? Is that uh, caused by the climate or, or something that people are doing in the vineyard? Uh, is it because of park or One thing that happened in California was uh, uh, they planted some grapevines that were not resistant to phylloxera throughout the Napa Valley, the premium wine growing area. And, and basically that got all killed. And they had to replant the whole of the Napa Valley uh, within the past 25 years or so. They planted with different uh, cloves, uh, different trellising arrangements. So lots of these things they've done may have influenced uh, the way the grapes come out. Uh, it, one of the stories they tell me is that, that these grapes just ripen later. What, what's hard to judge is, is ripeness is judged su subjectively by winemakers. And what's hard to judge is whether the, the definition of what's ripe has, has changed because of Parker. So you said they're ripening later. Yeah, that's one of the stories. So they're, harvest, they're definitely harvesting later. But look, one of the stories when I talk to them is that it's, it's because it, it's just the way they've redone the vineyard. Uh, they're ripening later than they would have uh, with the same climate and everything else. Uh, because Margaret Root is harvesting earlier. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, Barossa is about three weeks earlier on average than it was 20 years ago. And that's, that's climate change, they say. <coughs> but, but in this paper uh, that's published, we, we ran regressions and, and, uh, and found that, uh, as a matter of fact, over this period, we have a, our measure of, of, of climate, which is supposed to be okay for this purpose, it is, is the average of the daily high and the daily low temperature average over the growing period. So we measure daily high and low, take halfway between them every day, uh, average that over the, the growing period, which is uh, six months. Uh, it's a different six months in the southern hemisphere. And, uh, and uh, regress uh, sugar content against that and other variables. We find a statistically significant effect of uh, this climate variable on sugar content of grapes, but uh, the coefficient is small, sufficiently so that you need a really big change in climate to cause the rise in sugar content we've seen. And in fact, uh, the temperature actually over this period didn't rise. It's risen over a longer period. And there are other measures that probably have changed more so that uh, it seems that the, the overnight temperature has, has risen a bit, the average overnight temperatures, even though the average of the two hasn't changed appreciably. Um, so we observed, uh, incidentally, in this paper, these uh, discrepancies, and so we thought we'd uh, take a look at that. But the implication of these discrepancies, the first thought is that high alcohol content is a nuisance byproduct. That it's it's not something that uh, wine makers actually want, uh, and so that they they rather not admit to it. Uh, and there are things they can do to take the alcohol out. They can they can do reverse osmosis. They can do spinning current. Uh, these guys, uh, I think they're not meant to, but I think they add a lot of water. They're allowed to add water if it's necessary to complete the fermentation. And sometimes these grapes have so much sugar that the, that the alcohol gets so high it kills the yeast, even if the really good yeast that are tolerant of that. Uh, and so so uh, they can add water to finish the fermentation. 